Vox Church. How is everyone doing this morning? It is good to be with you. Welcome. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Mike. I'm executive pastor here at Vox. Good to be with you. What an honor it is to be with you today. Um, as Ryan mentioned, and perhaps you heard, no matter where you are, we're one church in 11 locations. And so every Sunday we stop and we say hello to everyone who's with us. So Bramford, can we welcome everyone who's with us this morning on Stream Church? We love you. Good morning. Good morning. Quick reminder for the men, this Saturday, Vox Exchange Men's Conference, if you haven't signed up, please do so. If your husband, boyfriend, friend, or whatever hasn't signed up, feel free to do it on his behalf, all right, and just let him know where he's got to be on Saturday here. We're excited for that, voxexchangeconference.com. It's going to be great, so I hope that's on your calendar, and we're excited for that. If you were here last week, we started a new sermon series called Knots. Our lead pastor kicked it off talking about friendship and I just want to say, you know, can we just thank our lead pastor for how he just faithfully leads us. We're so grateful for him and for Chrissy and for their family. If you haven't heard it yet, catch the podcast wherever you do that. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about marriage and family. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about singleness. And so we're excited. Yeah, all the singles in the room. All right, they're hooting and hollering. It's exciting. It's good. Today, we're talking about family. We're talking about family, all right? We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse 31, if you want to read along with me, all right? It says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's a lot in there, and there's a lot to cover today. If you're taking notes, the title of this morning's message is It's Worth the Work. It's Worth the Work. Let's pray. So God in heaven, as we tackle family this morning, God, we know that there are so many different stories here, so many different uh, ways that we've been formed and think about this. And so, God, right now, we just invite your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts as we open your word. God, I pray that we would leave changed, that you would speak directly to our hearts this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and pat yourself on the back this morning. You made it through another winter. All right? So, well done. All right? I don't know. I, yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but that first day when it's like 65 and it's sunny and you go outside and look at the sun and you're like, ah, happiness, there you are. Haven't seen you since November. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm depressed all winter long. You know, the weight of winter just seems to hang on us a little bit. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, you know. And so spring's here. We're all a little bit happier, a little kinder. For us, we, we love at our house, just love working in the yard. And so for me, that's getting the, the lawn going and the grass planted. And, and my wife is, is working on the flowers and planting vegetables, and, and if you've ever tried to plant vegetables, you know, I found it's an enormous amount of work for one salad come September, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, it's like all the sun, and, and all, you gotta get the water just right, and, and then you gotta plant them in the right kind of soil, you know, and, and there's cer certain vegetables, if you know, that they actually need more than just planting, you can't just plant them in a pot, no, 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 if you do that, then it, they're gonna grow sideways instead of vertically, and so some plants need a trellis. Maybe you've seen a trellis. It looks something like this. And so you can't just plant your vegetables in the, in the pot. No, 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 no. You got to plant something around it called like a trellis, which gives it a frame to grow on. So maybe take cucumbers, for example. You can take cucumbers like I would have, and you can just throw them in a pot, and water them, give them all the sun you want. But the problem is they're going to grow sideways. And as they grow sideways, the fruit or the vegetable, whichever it is that you consider a cucumber to be, all right? Technically, it's a fruit, which I think is just sacrilegious. Okay? Cucumbers are vegetables. But if you plant those in a pot, they begin, in a pot, they begin to go sideways, and the, and the fruit or the vegetable, it, it ends up on the ground, and it begins to rot. And, and it doesn't grow healthy. But if you give it a frame or a trellis to grow on, it actually grows vertically. It helps keep the disease at bay. It, it helps the, the fruit that you've worked so hard to grow actually be easier to harvest. Now, why are we talking about cucumbers at church on this Sunday, April 14th, as we talk about family? 
You see, just like I didn't understand that there were certain vegetables like cucumbers and tomatoes that needed a frame to grow on as if we wanted them to grow healthy, many of us don't understand that families are the same way. That God has put in place a trellis, a frame that families are meant to grow on in order so that they can grow vertically and grow healthy. That if you will, build it in the way that God has asked you to, it'll keep things in your home from rotting. It'll keep the fruit that you've been working so hard easier to harvest and enjoy. That there's actually a purpose and a plan behind God's vision for marriage that many of us don't even realize are there. Some of us, we, we just jumped into a family. Maybe you fell in love. You got married. You had a kid. And you haven't really given a whole, thought, whole lot of thought or intention to it. You find yourself six years into marriage and things are harder than you ever thought they'd be. And you're asking yourself, could this ever be good? ever be healthy. Maybe you're here and, and everything looks good on the outside. Maybe you go to community group and praise the Lord and bless them. You come here on Sunday, how are you? I'm just blessed. But everyone knows in your family that that's the farthest thing from the truth, that behind closed doors, things are actually sick on the inside, and broken. And there's a lot of dysfunction. And you're wondering, like, do I need to just repot this family plant and start over with someone new? Maybe you're here and you were so excited to become a parent. And now he's six years old or 16 and you always promised yourself you wouldn't be the dad who yells. But you keep losing your temper over and over again and you see the look on your child's face of fear. They look at you and they're scared and it breaks your heart and you just feel like you're coming up short over and over as a mom or a dad. I know what that feels like personally. You know, I can often feel like I'm just not doing a good enough job. Maybe you can relate. You feel like I'm not investing enough time in my family. I'm not discipling my kids well enough. I'm not loving my wife well enough. I'm far too distracted. I don't give them enough time on and on and on. And even on my best days, I can feel like I'm just a tired, impatient, guilt-ridden dad whose deepest hope is that Jesus loves my family more than I do and that his grace is sufficient in my weakness. And the more I talk to people, the more I realize so many families feel just like this, that we're just holding on for dear life, that things are more challenging than we ever expected they could be, that parents feel like they're trying their best, but they're falling short. Today we're going to look at three things as it pertains to family. God's purpose for the family God's plan for the family, and then God's power for the family. And I'll share some about how this plays out in the Schnepp household, but I also know that no two families look alike, that there are some families here in which both parents are at home. Some families here have just one parent at home. Some families here have no kids. Some have six. And God bless you. We have two, and I don't know how you have more. It's like some here, you have a blended family. I, I understand that, that families look different, and there's a lot of different places. But what I want you to see is that God's heart and vision for family can pertain to your situation and your scenario, no matter what it is. Okay, so, so, so Paul starts, and we read it, verse 31, talking to husbands and wives. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It was Mark Twain who famously said, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you begin to find out why. I was 20 years old when uh, I began to actually follow Jesus. I have great parents who led me to, to know about God and from a very early age, but the truth is I had just never surrendered. I'd never given my life to Jesus. And so, you know, I lived those first 20 years just making decisions based on what I wanted to do, just solely self-interested and and many of you can relate to stories like that. And then I read a book by a pastor named Rick Warren when I was 20. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. And maybe you've read it. You open up the book, and the very first chapter starts with four words. It says, it's not about you. It's not about 
you. And that hit me like a lightning bolt. That's not a new idea. Like you hear that and you go, well, duh. But for me, God had been priming my heart and showing me just this selfishness and self-preoccupation that I've been living with. And I began to understand that God had created me first for his purpose, for his mission, not my own, not my own desires, not my own self-fulfillment and achievements. And it changed everything for me. And it had the same effect on a lot of other people as well, millions. Some, some statisticians, well, I won't say that next service. I'll tell you that much. I'm going to say that differently, okay? <laughs> some people say that this is actually the second best-selling book of all time behind the Bible. Millions of people have found that their lives need to be driven by purpose, that the human soul is meant to thrive by having a reason to get up in the morning, a reason to get out of bed, a a way to live your life that expands far beyond yourself, that your life is not meant to dead end on your own happiness, but it's actually meant to expand and ripple out into the lives of other people. Scientists tell us that people who live with this kind of purpose have better brain function, they live longer, that they're less depressed, that they report higher levels of satisfaction in life because the human soul is meant to live with purpose beyond itself. Now consider how this relates to family. See, most people, when you ask them what the purpose for their family is, the three most common answers are love, I love this person. I want to be with them. Companionship. I just enjoy having someone with me. It it helps with my loneliness. Or or third is is developing a family, having children. I want the experience of having a parent. And now we all know inherently those are are beautiful things. And anybody who has a family, hopefully you're enjoying those things. Love, companionship. And if you have children, just the, the joy of being a parent. But here's the problem. If the fundamental purpose for your family are one of those three things, then your family's vulnerable. Because if that's the reason and the purpose and the very foundation of your family, at the end of the day, it's about your self-fulfillment. And so what's the glue that holds you together when, as the great theologians, the Righteous Brothers said, you've lost that loving feeling? Oh, that Loving feel. What holds you together when the love goes away? What happens when your companion feels more like an adversary? What keeps you in the marriage? If you've built your family around raising kids, what keeps the marriage together when the kids go off to college? See, if the fundamental purpose for your family are the things that you want and the things that you get out of the family, then it's only a matter of time till you're asking the question, why am I still here? Paul addresses this directly for us. He says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he answers it for us. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What's he telling us? He's telling us that before your marriage, before your family is about your happiness, before it is about solving your loneliness, about having a companion, before it is about raising kids, it's about painting a picture of the good news of Jesus. It's that your family is meant to serve as a picture of the gospel, that it's meant to portray to a world that desperately needs him that God loves them, and the way your family interacts with each other is meant to be a beacon of his good news, that your family would actually point to a truth bigger than itself, that the fundamental a uh, fundamental purpose of your family is to point people to Jesus. See, if we're going to be families that, that come through the ups and downs, that come through the changing seasons, that come through the fights and frustrations and can come out the other side, we need to understand that it's not just about us. That's about something bigger. A family thrives when it has purpose. It changes the way I love those in my family when I understand this. See, when I begin to love how Christ has loved me, I can choose my wife's needs and desires over my own. You know, when, when I need to forgive, and I don't want to, 
what urges and pushes me to forgive is to remember that Christ has forgiven me far more than whatever it is I'm choosing to need to forgive in that moment. When my kids are being entitled little brats, can we be honest? Is it okay to be honest? All right. I remember the countless times that I've done that to God. When I've just been an entitled little jerk and he loved me anyways. You know? I can pursue, I pursue the, the heart of my wife and my two daughters because Christ pursued me first. And it changes everything inside my family. I love how Justin Early, the author, writes this. He says, the most Christian way to think about our households is that they are little schools of love. Places where we have one vocation, one calling, to form all who live here into lovers of God and neighbor. We talk about purpose. We talk about purpose. What's the first purpose of a husband and a wife? It's to sacrificially love one another as Christ has loved us. What is the first goal that a parent should have? It's to teach your kids to love God and to share his love with others. How do we do this in our home? A couple practical things. First, we prioritize the pursuit of Jesus personally. All right, the greatest gift I believe I can give my family is a passionate pursuit of Jesus. And so we prioritize that first as individuals, but then as a family, we prioritize being at church together. Now, I know you're going to say, nice pastor answer, all right? You say that, you believe that because you work here. The truth is, church, I work here because I believe that. You see, the church, I believe, is one of the most powerful ways to form in my family an understanding that their purpose is beyond themselves. See, I believe that there's power when my family comes together and worships together. It reminds us that we are built for more than just ourselves. We come every week because I'm pretty sure, to my best knowledge, in my girls' classes and on the lacrosse teams that they play on, they are the only Christian. And so we come to church on Sunday so they can other, interact with other kids their age who love Jesus, so they can see that their faith isn't foreign. That there are people just like them who love Jesus. That it's not strange to love Jesus. I want them to understand that. In a world, listen, if our society really is 2% lovers of Jesus, 2%, that means that most of the time my kids are around people who don't share their values. But in church, they come, they realize, man, I'm not alone in this. I'm not alone in this fight. Brittany and I pr prioritize giving to the mission of God here because we remind our hearts that earthly comforts is not the end goal. And so we prioritize being with God's family. Another idea that we've, we've taken through the years is, is we created a motto, a family motto. And, and this isn't our idea. We've stolen this from other people. We realized we needed one because we got called to the principal's office. Now, every parent, it's like your worst nightmare, right? Like you get the call, Mr. Schnepp, we're having some behavioral issues. Now, listen, this was the principal of pre-K, okay? <laughs> we didn't even make it to kindergarten before we got called in. And we were like, oh, no, something's got to give. We were having the, and so we just said, listen, my girls were really young at this age. We just said, hey, Schnepps make people happy. Now I know people were like, well, you can't always make, it. shut up, okay? At the time, it was helpful, okay? Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to give my girls a grid that says, hey, our family exists to be a blessing to the world. And so it enabled us to bring conversation around what is the purpose as you go to school today? It's to bring God's love into your classroom, all right? The last thing is we had to decide what we want to do in our home. And so before the go girls go to school every day, I bless them. I pray over them. We pray at night before bed. We're actually trying this new thing where our, our kids have been learning instruments. And so we have like a monthly worship night where we all, I strap on a guitar and, and my wife's got piano and my youngest has drum. And we just play worship. And it sounds terrible, all right? <laughs> but we're trying to do it once a month. It's not even barely music. I'm just saying, okay? But we're worshiping God together. And the truth is we missed last month. Because we got busy. Why? Because the point of this is not perfection. It's progress. And it's helping me, my wife, my girls understand that the purpose for our family is bigger than ourselves. So the first thing we're going to say is this. What is the purpose for family? The glory of God. 
a couple great books that have been super helpful for me. I'm going to give you some books along the way today that have been helpful in our journey of learning this. The first is called The Meaning of Marriage by the late Tim Keller. And then the second book that's been really helpful for us is called Habits of the Household by Justin Early. All right? If you want to pick those up at some point on Amazon, they, they've been really helpful for us. Um, so Paul starts at the 30,000-foot level. And he says, what is the purpose of family? But then he begins to, to bring it down to ground level. And he begins to get practical. He says, what's the plan for developing this kind of family? And he says this, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. In our verse here, Paul is highlighting something that we all know. That men and women are wired differently. Remember the old book, Men Are From Mars? Women Are From Venus, right? Generally, what Paul is alluding to here is, is something that you've probably heard about over the last 10, 20 years. There's been a great book called Love and Respect by Emerson Egrix. It's about this idea that men and women tend to generally receive love and affirmation in different ways. That men tend to feel most fulfilled when they are respected. And wives tend to feel most fulfilled when they experience love. But the problem is, most men and women, couples, husbands, wives, all of us, we tend to love those we love in the way that we want to receive love. And then we're shocked when there's a disconnect, you know? Maybe you've read the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. It's the same idea, that there are ways that we best receive love. I'll never forget when I, I learned this lesson very dearly. I, uh, I used to be a memento guy, all right? So like every trip I went on, like I got a little knickknack. Anybody like mementos? You know, like you kind of come home from a trip and, and you put something on the shelf. And so, like, for example, all right, like, I went to this fair, and I had to throw a baseball and knock down all these cans. And, and I did it, and they gave me this giant lobster. And the giant lobster lived in my bedroom. But I didn't do it when I was six. I did it when I was 16. And so, like, you know, it, it wasn't very cool, all right? And so imagine my wife comes along. We start to date. She hates knickknacks. Our, our home has, like, no clutter, all right? If it doesn't have a purpose, throw it away. So you can imagine she was kind of rude about my lobster, okay? <laughs> so it's our first Valentine's Day together, and she's out. I told you a couple weeks ago she was out in Colorado, and so it was our first Valentine's Day. And so I thought, man, I'm going to give her something to commemorate our first Valentine's Day together, okay? Something that she can keep on the shelf <laughs> and remember. And so I got, her something, I got her something that looked like this. And I think she thought I was pranking her. I think she thought it was a joke. And then, and then we had a moment that wasn't, pl wasn't pretty when, when we realized this wasn't a joke. Now, it wasn't quite that bad. It might have said Happy Valentine's Day. But it was a bottle of sand art, okay? That's about as knick-knacky and cheesy and tchotchke as you can possibly imagine. And in that moment, I realized I had some learning to do if I was going to learn to love this woman in a better way. Now, my wife, she's all physical affection, okay? So the more, the more touch there is, the more she feels filled up. And does God always put opposites together? Because for me, it's like, cool, all right. We, you know, why is it that, okay, anyways. But, but that's how she receives love. Not so me, just saying, not so, okay? So if, if you see me and you hug me, know that it's at cost to me, Okay? <laughs> But if my wife says to me, Mike, I just want you to know that I admire you and I think you're an incredible man, it will move me to tears. Why? Because that's how I receive love. That's what respect looks like for me, those types of things. So here's the first thing I want you to ask for a plan. We're going to talk about marriage and dating next week, and so I'm not going to linger here long. But do you have an intentional plan to love your spouse the way he or she wants to be loved? Do you have an intentional plan to love your kids? the way that they want to be loved. This is the first part of what is a three-part plan that he has, that, that Paul gives us here, is that you need a plan to love your spouse. I mentioned these two books, again, two that are going to be very helpful for you in your journey. The first is The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman or Emerson Egrick's Love and Respect. Both of these have transformed my wife and I's relationship. And so pick those up if you want to learn and watch what happens. It will, it will transform your family. All right, let's keep going. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. You know, no one comes into your family as a blank slate. 
Nobody comes in perfectly ready to be a parent. We're all a jumbled mess of beauty and brokenness, right? Of the ways that we've been changed by God and the parts of our hearts that are still in process. You know what stuck out to me this week? Notice that he doesn't say, don't be angry at your children. Like, if I read that, I would, I, that's what I would expect him to say. Fathers, don't be angry at your children. He says, don't provoke them to anger. See, what's he driving at here? He wants us to see that our actions have direct impact on our kids. That the way you love them, the way you raise them, actually affects who they become. Now, I've never met a parent who had like a pregnancy announcement and was like, I just can't wait to meet this kid and start to screw them up. You know, like no parent like wants to be that kind of parent. And yet every single one of us, we see how our, in some form or fashion, like the brokenness that we have as human beings, it comes out. Our impatience, our anger. Some of my ter most terrible moments as a parent have been when that impatience, that angerness, that selfishness just boils over and I, I lose my temper, I raise my voice. And I'm one of those dads who's seen that look in my kid's face. And it's so ugly. I hate that that's within me. You know, at all times, I feel like no matter how many times I get it right as a dad, I nail that moment, that conversation. I bring the encouragement when they need it. I'm thoughtful about how I love them. It feels like my own brokenness is just never that far away. You know, I know that some of us, though, you know, we're just passing on what we learned from the families we grew up in. Maybe you know it. Maybe you don't even understand that you've been formed by your past and your experience. Maybe you grew up in a home that every argument just went straight to yelling. You grew up in a family that, that didn't know how to handle conflict. And you get married and you start a family. And what happens when your family gets in an argument? You just default to what you know. And you just raise your voice and begin to yell. I don't know if you're familiar with the idea of family of origin. It's all throughout the scriptures. It's this idea that, that there are generational patterns that affect our families. That are passed on from generation to generation, both positively and also negatively as well. Your upbringing, your experiences, the things that have formed you and created you, that shaped you, the ways you may not even know, you bring that, that good and that bad, into your homes. And that these patterns, if we're not careful, these patterns go from generation to generation until somebody stands and says no more. Did you know that if you struggle with alcoholism, your kids are four times more likely to battle substance abuse in their lives as well. That there's a direct correlation in your engagement and relationship with alcohol to whether your kids will struggle with it as well. You know what I've learned is as much as I hate it, my kids follow much more what they see than what I say, you know? Mark Batterson, he's an author. He, he wrote the Praying the Circles books that maybe some of you have read. He has this quote that has stuck with me just so deeply. He says this. He says, at the end of the day, I want to be famous in my own home. He says, success is when those that know you best respect you the most. And so listen, we need a plan to reform our souls. That you can't get away from the fact that who you are is who you bring. And so listen, if you're bringing stuff into your home that you don't want passed on, do whatever you have to do to get rid of it. If you got to go to counseling, go to counseling. If you got to begin sharing it with a friend, share with a friend. Listen, you can pass on anger from generation or you can pass on faith. All right? You can, you can pass on how to handle conflict Poorly, or you can pass on courage in a God who loves them. Like parents, we pass on who we are. What are you passing on? And so if you're seeing things come out of you that are ugly, do whatever it takes to begin uprooting that so you can bring your best every day and you can pass on a soul that has been reformed and is healthy and is good. Ask yourself the question, if my kids grow up and they become all that I am, and every all the good and the bad, will I be proud of that? If the answer is no, what are the things you can begin doing and changing and reshaping in you so that they get your best, so that your spouse gets your best? 
So this is part two. If the first part of the plan is that you need a plan to love your spouse, the second part of the plan is that you need a plan to reform your soul. And then there's a third part. He says this, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This one's pretty simple. He's saying, fathers, specifically, you need a plan to raise your kids to love Jesus. You need an intentional, thoughtful plan for how you're raising your children to fall in love with their Savior. And the truth is, I'm not looking to shame anyone, but, but a lot of parents have a better plan for college than they do for eternity. Francis Chan says it like this. Pastor, maybe you've heard him. He says, I am working to ensure that my family is set up for the future. When most people make that statement, they're talking about financial security for their last few years on earth. When I say it, I'm referring to the millions of years that come after that. That's so good. You know, I think sometimes as parents, we forget that our kids are being formed every single day. Society, TV, friends, mentors, teachers, they are being told in a ton of different ways what they should think about God, what they should think about us as parents, what they should think about faith, what they should think about individuality, what they should think about sexuality. Parents, what is our plan to combat that? What is our plan to push back on the formation that is happening every day? Listen, we don't live in fear, but we also don't live naively. Remember what the Apostle Peter said in the book 1 Peter. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Listen, the devil's not waiting until your kids get voting age. To begin moving against them. He's not waiting until they're 18. Your job as a parent is to train your kids to love Jesus. To bolster their faith. To teach them why we believe what we believe. So that they can stand strong when their worldview is challenged. When their faith is challenged. That they can understand why they believe what they believe. And you're setting them up for success. How do you get there first? For example, for us, our our oldest is in fourth grade. And so our daughters are nine and six. And so some of you have heard everything I said, and and you're just saying, wait till you have teenagers. Okay, I hear that, all right? But it's what I have. (laughs) So so my daughter is nine, and and she's going in fourth grade. And so last summer, my wife sat down with her, and she did the birds and the bees talk. And uh, it has led to some hilarious conversations in, in the days after that. And at first, it seemed like she was just so young. But the more we talk to people, the more they said, like, that age of when kids are finding out is becoming younger and younger and younger. And we wanted to get there first. We wanted to shape the narrative around sexuality instead of correcting the narrative that she hears on the bus. And so our plan was to do everything we could to get there before anyone else did. Parents, God is calling you to lead the spiritual development of your children. To bring a plan, not to leave it to others. The church can be a part of it, but don't entrust it totally to the church. Take ownership. So many of us are reacting instead of initiating. What would it look like for you to begin to initiating the preparation of your kids for all that the world will challenge and throw at them? And so this is the third piece of planning. If the first was a plan to love your spouse well, the second was a plan to reform your soul, the third is this. You need a plan to lead your kids. Again, book, the one that's been really helpful for us, just as an aside, Family Discipleship. It's right there by Matt Chandler. Parents, if you're feeling like this is an area that you want to grow in, this book has been really helpful. Now, there's books on books. There's so much out there. But this one for us, it came out about five years ago, has been really, really helpful. Now, I want you to see that that. As we create a plan, we need all three facets. I want you to see how they interrelate together. So you've got, you've got a plan for, for three different things at the same time. You guys can go ahead and throw that diagram up. Okay, so, so plan one is we, we need to plan to love our spouse well. And we talked about reforming our soul and leading your kids. And this is why you need all three. Because listen, if I, if I have learned to love my spouse well, and I've learned I've got a plan for my kids but I erupt in anger once a month. It's 
it's going to be hard for me to have a healthy home. It's going to be hard for my kids to understand who God is in a healthy way. If I've, if I've learned to lead them well and I've, I've done the hard work of changing who I am, but I don't love my spouse well, then the moment my kids are out of the house, my marriage has nothing to stand on and no reason to exist. If I've, if I've loved my spouse well and I've done the hard work of my own soul, but I don't have a plan for my kids, I'm just leaving them to, to anyone else to form them. It's a terrible plan. And the goal is not perfect kids, all right? The goal is not a perfect marriage. The goal, when you put all three together, is a healthy family. That's the goal. It's not perfect. Listen, you're going to screw up regularly. The amount of times I've had to apologize to my own children, to my spouse, still shocks me, all right? I was, <laughs> I was preparing this sermon and Brittany came in and tried talking to me, and I was short with her because I was like, excuse me, I'm preparing a, family, uh, a message on healthy family. Can you leave me alone, please? <laughs> Kid you not, that was uh, yesterday. Okay. So the point is not perfection. You will never get this right. But what would it look like if you actually brought a plan into it? So what we do, just again, practically in the Schnepp home, we, uh, every January, my wife and I make a plan for the year. And so we set relationship goals for us. Some things like that are, we're going to go out once a month on a date. It's not revolutionary. We're going to get away for an extended time without our kids once a year. And so we're going we're gonna to do those things and a number of other ones. Then we've got a plan for each of our kids. So our oldest, who's nine, like this year, we actually, we're going to send her away to a Christian sleepaway camp for the first time. It's going to push her in her independence, going to help her grow. But I also want her to surround her with counselors who are 15, 16, 17, who she's going to think are really cool and are going to tell her how much they love Jesus. Because I want her to see from an early age that it's not uncool to love Jesus. We're going to watch as a family. We're going to watch the Chosen series together. Why? Just because I want to begin giving them a picture of who Jesus is. Now, what are these things? Are they the silver bullet? Are they going to guarantee a family that loves? No, they're not. But they're all part of the process, you know? I've got a friend that I meet with once a month, and we hold each other accountable. We share these goals with one another, and it helps me remember, because when I know that next week I'm meeting with my buddy, I'm a little bit more thoughtful about making sure I'm doing this. Because without it, I slide back into apathy, into laziness. You get busy. You forget about these things. But, man, it's worth it, isn't it? It's worth it. Now, I know that some of us hear this, and we think to ourselves, Mike, that just sounds so churchy perfect. You know? Like, man, if you knew the mistakes I've already made for my family, you'd understand why this is. I, I could never. If you knew the way that I grew up, if you knew the things that have formed me, all the brokenness, I, I can't help. It's, I'm too far gone. Listen. Paul speaks to you this morning as well. A couple verses later, he sums up everything he says. And he says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This is his solution to the how. How do I possibly live with a purpose this grand? How do I possibly live with an ongoing plan for the development of those I love through the strength of Jesus? See, some of us forget that because of our relationship with God, he's the vine where the branches through our abiding in him, we have access to a divine reservoir of his love. And that if we will tap into it and we'll begin to say, God, you got to help me love my family better. God, I keep messing up over it. Would you change me, God? God, I pray that you would bless my kids today. God, I pray that you would help me to love my wife better. God, protect her as she goes into this meeting today. Whatever it is, listen, some of us are trying to do this on our own. And we're doing it without access to the very power source for seeing this come to be. You cannot achieve this through effort alone. You can only achieve this by receiving the love of God, allowing it to flow through you. And this is why your relationship with Jesus personally is so important. Because without it, you have nothing to give. It's just your effort, your tries, and we all know eventually that well runs dry. But what if? What if you began to understand that the very strength of God, 
the resurrected Christ is available to you because of your relationship with him. By abiding in him, you find the strength to fight for that marriage that's on its last hope. The power, the power to become the man or woman that your children desperately need you to be. The power to initiate instead of just react. So we'll say it like this. The third thing, the power for family, the power to see all this come to be, is God's spirit in me. Let's stand together. I want you to know, church, that family is hard. It's beautiful in so many ways, but it's also hard. And I want to remind you that you have a family here at Vox who wants to do this with you. If you're fighting for these things alone, it's way harder than it needs to be. We've got groups. We've got groups that meet on how to be better parents, groups on family discipleship, groups called Parenting on Purpose. We've got resources for marriages, five different VBSs this summer. What are they going to do? They're going to teach your kids how to love Jesus better. You don't have to go this alone. But I just want you to picture, just imagine with me, what your family could look like 12 months from now. How things could change. How things could look different. If you began to look at your family as the purpose, the reason why we exist is to give glory to God and to share his mission with others. Imagine with me how your marriage would change if you both set to loving each other really well and you actually put a plan in place. You put a plan in place to, to look at the parts of your heart that are sideways and broken and you said this is the year that I'm going to go after those things because I want to give the best version of myself to those who matter most to me and then you actually thoughtfully answered the question how am I going to lead my kids to love Jesus this year and you did all of that wrapped the power of God's spirit your family will never look the same you'll look back 12, 12 months from now and you realize that on this warm April Sunday, God started something in you, and you can never go back to the way things were. That there are some marriages that I think can be resurrected if you'll choose to love each other the way Christ has loved you, if you'll choose to forgive the way that Christ has forgiven you, that things can change. I want you to walk out not hearing all the things you should do and feel shame, but walk out hearing all the things you can do and have hope. Because it's not done. It's not over. The story's not done. That God has something powerful for you. Let's pray. God in heaven, we do thank you. We thank you that tucked in your word are the tools that we need. And so God, I know every single one of us who hears this feels some mix of encouragement at what could be, some shame at what isn't right now some discouragement of the way that we've done it wrong in the past, and yet, God, you come to us in this moment, and you say, look at me. Get your eyes off your shame. Get your eyes off your past. Get your eyes off all the things that you've done wrong, and set your eyes to the future, that this can be day one of a new reality for our family. And so, God, right now, we ask that you would fill us with hope, that you would fill us with vision. God, I pray that you would help us to fall deeper in love with you first so that we can then love those in our lives even better. And so, God, would you change us? Would you shape us? God, I pray that we would be a church filled with families that are pursuing you first and displaying your love to a world that so desperately needs you by the way that we do it. Come, Lord Jesus. Would you lead us? In your name,